My name is Bill Willis, and I am in Nashville, Tennessee today, November the 15th, 1999, to interview my longtime friend and colleague Cecil D. Branstetter. This interview is taking place as part of the Legal History Project of the Fellows of the Tennessee Bar Foundation. Cecil, let's start where you started. You entered this life on December the 15th, 1920, in Morgan County, Tennessee. Tell us uh, something about uh, your mother and father and your siblings and what life was like as a child growing up in rural Morgan County. That was a long time ago. <laughs> well, the, I was uh, fourth down the line on, on 14 children. My mother had 14 children. They didn't all live. Two sets of ten, twins did not survive. Uh, we were some 20 odd miles from the nearest doctor. My mother was never in a hospital a day in her life until she fell and broke her hip at the age of 93. The, 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 uh, the, we, I grew up during the depression and uh, it was truly a depression in the country, but we lived on a small farm, did saw milling, my father did, and of course that was dead during the depression. The, uh, I, I had uh, my oldest sister, who is still alive at 82 or 83, uh, she took 15 years to get to her college degree going at night at Cookville, and she taught school and is now retired. Most of the other my other sister and most of my brothers uh, were able to get out for a while and go to Detroit during the Depression and get a job. They all came back as soon as they could, as soon as they retired. And uh, five of us, uh, the boys, are still alive and one sister. How, uh, I assume you were born at, at home. Born at home. All of, all of the children were born at home, midwife. Uh, I can remember not when I was born, but I can remember having been told who the midwife was and a very lovely, skinny lady uh, by the name of La Lavender, and she had uh, told me uh, when I was old enough to remember that uh, she had delivered hundreds of babies in the county and that uh, every time that she uh, had delivered a baby that had a film over their face, they were destined to be great. Oh. And I assume <laughs> you had a film story. over your face. <laughs> yes, right. So she said. How did the Branstetters uh, end up in Morgan County? Well, there was three brothers came over from Germany, from the Wartburg-Baden area, uh, the old Wartburg-Baden area of Germany in the early 1800s. One, they came through all through Pennsylvania, and one came to uh, Kentucky and stayed for quite a while. One, my parent, grandparents came to Morgan County and settled out of Wartburg. They named the little area of Wartburg. There was also a Franklin there as well that uh, was a little German community. And uh, they were, as, you, as I just had noted to you previously, very prolific. Uh, there were one brother went on to Arkansas and later to Missouri, and one stayed in, in Kentucky. How, uh, how far were you from the closest town? Uh, well, if you, Deer Lodge was what would be call, called the closest town. As of this date, it has about 700 inhabitants. Back then, they were probably 50 to 70. There's a church there, there's a school there, uh, and that was about it. I went to one-room school through the seventh grade, which was called Pleasant Green School. Now, how many grades were in that one room? Uh, all, all eight grades in the, in the one room, and it had an average daily attendance, if I've checked this historically back, of an uh, average of 50 students and one teacher. How, how far was the school from your home? About uh, three miles, and of course uh, there was no busing in those days. I got accustomed to that later when they consolidated the schools. In high school, I rode a bus. I was bused early on uh, when I started the high school. Uh, four, uh, 12 miles on 
going and coming over gravel roads, and many times the bus could not run. I went one year to Deer Lodge when the eighth grade, when they consolidated Pleasant Green and the Deer Lodge School. And we, uh, uh, my family and many others, uh, wasn't many others, but a few others that went to that school walked that five miles many times because the bus didn't run in the muddy winter time. You were in grammar school and high school during the Depression? Yes. What was it like in Morgan County during the Depression? The, uh, well, the, I imagine that to some degree it was better than the, the, the horrible situations that existed in the cities. We raised all we, what we ate. We had 50 acres farm, raised cattle, had, had uh, milk cows uh, for ourselves, chickens for eggs. Uh, uh, hogs for pork. We 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 ate fairly well, and my mother was very uh, adept at canning hundreds of cans of uh, of uh, green beans, and we would thresh out uh, the uh, soup beans and put them in sacks and hang them up. So, uh, and the the that moved in just about that time. A Polish community was created just not far from where we were and from where we were living, and they, they were wonderful people, really. They, they could take a 10-acre farm and absolutely make a better living than most of them could on a 100-acre farm. I know, remember one, Jacob Oski, uh, the name <laughs> stuck with me through the years. Uh, he had, I believe, eight or nine children They moved down to Chicago, came through Chicago, most of the Polish people did, and uh, he was able eventually to acquire 60 acres, and he was just in, he seventh heaven. He was absolutely tickled to death. He had 10 acres in Poland when he was there to support a family on, and he said most of it averaged three to 10 acres. During uh, your growing up years, grammar school, high school in Morgan County, what uh, recreational activities were there? Did you go to the mall? <laughs> well, a Paul Mall, the little town was about about twenty miles away. No, we our closest neighbor uh, was uh, oh just a mile or so away, and then they were scattered out or away in, into Deer Lodge, Sunbright, uh, to Wartburg, and the, and to Frankfurt, and the we we were too busy really to do much. From the standpoint of recreation, we we were always told that when we got uh, our crops laid by, or we got the potatoes dug, or the corn gathered, uh, then we could go fishing. And the sad part about that was we never did get finished too much <laughs> during the summer to go fishing. Occasionally we would do it, and we had a there's a small creek about a mile and a half from where we were that had a about a seven foot of water in one of the holes, and we swam there and. Uh, church, there was church activity to some extent. How did the family travel? Uh, we traveled with, uh, with the wagon and a pair of mules. We never owned a car while I was growing up. We didn't have electricity until after I left to go to college. And it were, we had an unladen lamp, a coal, coal oil lamp. <laughs> Let's talk about high school for a minute. Where did you go to high school? Went to high school at Sunbright. Tennessee, and that uh, we, were, we, of course, rode the bus. It was 12 miles away. How many in your um, high school class? In my class, as finally graduating, I believe there was 18 or 20. And uh, that, was, that was in, really, the Depression was still going on pretty heavily. And uh, I've, I, to this day, am tremendously biased, and properly so, in favor of the New Deal. I swept floors at the school in order to buy my clothes. Went to school under the youth, uh, the youth program that Roosevelt administration had created, among other things. Uh, the WPA, uh, the men were working the roads, uh, building small bridges, building outhouses all over the county. So the New Deal, to me, was a total godsend, and I appreciate it to this day. I neglected to ask you a little earlier, but uh, growing up, uh, and by that I mean grammar school, high school, what access to books did you have? Uh, well, of course, the, the, there were no library as such in, in, in the Pleasant Green School through the seventh grade. There was a very limited library during the eighth grade in Deer Lodge School, 
and very, very limited library at the high school. I mean, just no books hardly at all. Uh, the, uh, I read whatever I could get. Uh, there was a grit magazine that I delivered. Uh, we got a nickel a copy when we could collect on that. I read a little bit on that, and I knew there had to be better places than where I was. Uh, I, I recall this, Bill. The, uh, there's an abandoned house from uh, the people that left, uh, a lot of people that left to go to the north for jobs. And uh, as children will, they prowl through the house, uh, the abandoned house. And I ran across a copy of the Iliad and the Odyssey when I was, I guess, eight or nine. And I read and read and read, and I didn't understand it then, and I don't understand it now. That was my, that was my background as far as classics were concerned. I did read later on, of course, uh, Andrew uh, Jackson's biographies, autobiographies, and was very much impressed. Did uh, you have any particular teacher that you recall made an impact on you that that had an influence on your future career? Uh, a couple. My, fir my first teacher was Jenny Apes. And uh, she, she was indeed a great person. I went to the third grade the first year that I was in school. Uh, my sister, uh, Eula, who is now deceased, uh, took me to school. They'd let them, when you got to be five, they'd let you go and visit to school. And so she took me, and I would sit and listen. And of course, the, uh, the conducting of classes in this one room school was in the presence of all students. You'd call the, you'd call the class up. Well, by the time I finished the first year, I, I knew everything that's in the first and second. Just like that. You know, sit there, you'd listen, listen sometimes. <laughs> and we had a pot bellied stove, wood stove to heat. And I can remember we'd gather around that stove in the wintertime, and the class would ring around it to keep warm. And so uh, I knew, when it went, as I say, went to the third grade the first year that I was in school. Now, what high school teachers do you particularly recall? I, the, uh, the, a gentleman by the name of Johnson was basically a French teacher, he, and he was the one that impressed me most. Uh, the, uh, as a matter of fact, he kept telling me, uh, you have to go to college. And I said, I was old enough to know and knew my circumstances and financial condition. And I kept telling him, there's no way in the world that I can raise any money. Well, he said, I'll tell you what, he said, I live up at Harrogate, Tennessee, and uh, the, the, that's Lincoln Memorial University is located there. And he, he said, if you will just, when you finish high school, you just pack up your suitcase. And I had one suit that I'd worked in a sawmill and got $14 to buy from Sears Roebuck. He said, pack up your suitcase hitchhike up to Lincoln Memorial University, C.P. Williams. He's the administrative head of admissions and so forth. And so I did just that. And I had $14 when I started hitchhiking to Lincoln Memorial University. And I went in to saw C.P. Williams. And he said, you got, do you have any money? You want to go to school? And I said, no, I've got 14 bucks. And he said, well, can you milk cows? I said, sure, I milk cows ever since I was five years old. He said, all right, go down and report to the barn and tell them that uh, you can, you'll be a new cow milker. And the university had a tremendous big farm. And so uh, I did that and uh, paid my entire way for three years, uh, and including books and uh, board and tuition. I want to come back there just in just a moment. But first, I want to ask you that during your growing up years, grammar school, high mm -hmm. school, so forth, did you know any lawyers? Had you formed any impressions about the law? Had any experiences involving mm -hmm. the law? The only, the closest thing that I came to that was I had a, a, a somewhat of a distant cousin, even in that period, who came through the, to the Kentucky end of the Branstetters. And he came, he studied law at uh, uh, Lebanon, Cumberland, Cumberland University, uh, for, I believe, eight months. And, but he never did practice law. He had talked to me some about becoming a lawyer. When I was 13, uh, the, uh, I was subpoenaed to testify in a murder case in Crossville. My father and two of my brothers were hunting at night, and, uh, and 
the people came down the little creek where we had a fire built and talked to us a few minutes and that say the person that came down with his son was accused of murdering someone at about just that time over in Cumberland County at a deer hunting incident. So I testified at that trial and became quite impressed with the judicial process. So you process. were an alibi witness? I, I, absolutely. It didn't work at the trial court, but the Supreme Court uh, kicked it out and said that that young man that talked was telling the truth and you don't have any evidence at all and this case is dismissed. Well, let's go, excuse me. Go ahead, no, that. No. Let's go back for a moment to, to Harrogate and Lincoln Memorial University. You entered there in what year? That had been the end of 38 after I got out of And you went there how many years? Three years. And where did you go after that? Well, my, my father died at 49 uh, when I was in the third year, and I'd had a limited amount of controversy with C.P. Williams at the university over whether he should pay the farmhands a little more. Uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, uh, I, I left and went to, uh, after the third year, I had an aunt in California at shipyards. And I left and went out there and worked in the shipyard uh, for a couple of years and then went into the United States Army. Did you, um, were you drafted in the Army? No, I agreed to, to go in and I, I, I had second thoughts about that because it put me in the combat engineers. <laughs> now let's fast forward here just a moment from Lincoln Memorial University in Harrogate, Tennessee to after the war when you met a woman named Charlotte who was from Harrogate. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that strike you as being somewhat ironical since she's been your wife for 50 odd years? 56 years. And where did you meet her? I met her while I was at Lincoln Memorial University at what was called, we went to, they had Christian Endeavor uh, at an orphanage just outside this school area. And uh, several of the boys at, at the creamery, we lived in the, in the creamery building, they called it. And so we, we attended that, uh, it was a non-denominational church. Uh, and I met Charlotte at, uh, at that uh, Christian Endeavor and, and, was, uh, and she lived just across the highway from the university. And I had the occasion to, no car, but I could walk that short distance and did so many times. And what was her maiden name? Coleman, Charlotte Coleman. Now, fast forward just a little bit more. You spent two years in uh, the shipyards in California. Mm -hmm. then, roughly two years. Roughly two years. two years. Then you spent how many years in the military? Three years to the day. So after you finished the military, you came back to George Washington University uh, in Washington, D.C. That is correct. And lo and behold, there was Charlotte. Yeah, I thought I, I was following her around, but she uh, <laughs> accused me of saying that she probably followed me around. But so you and Charlotte <laughs> had maintained uh, contact for five years. Yes, that is correct. And I was stationed in Camp Gordon, Georgia, when we got we got married before we went I pulled, before I went overseas. Now. Tell me a little bit about your military experience. You volunteered, and mm -hmm. what branch of the service did you join? I was, uh, uh, I was in the combat engineers, and I took basic training in Camp Cook, California, and that was the coldest place. I had an old overcoat, a top coat that I wore in Tennessee in the snow, went out there in that damp cold, I nearly froze to death <laughs> in, basic, in basic training. <laughs> but uh, had basic training there, and then, well, I, I went to Fort MacArthur just for a month or so in the beginning. All of the inductees went there first from where I was in Long Beach, California. And so then up to Camp Cook, for basic training. And then I was shipped back east. Uh, it's amazing how things happen and may or may not be of interest, but uh, I had a very rough uh, first sergeant. He, his name was Sergeant, too. And he'd come down from building the Alaskan Highway or Road, you know, and they were, they were really, really rough. So he, uh, we were out camping out one time, and there's a young boy there that was uh, uh, 
apparently what you call a mother's boy. He just had never been around anywhere. He got poison ivy. He always had troubles just of all sorts. And so one day I, when he had poison ivy all over him, the sergeant came up and I was standing there. And he just reamed that kid out ungodly. And so I didn't have any better sense than saying, now, sergeant, this boy can't help what he is doing or catching poison ivy at all, and you're being very unfair and jumping on him like that. And if you want to jump on somebody, jump on me. And he said, I'll court-martial you f just for sure. Well, he didn't. He was, and instead of that, he talked to me the next day and said, I'd like for you to be company clerk. <laughs> so nobody had ever spoken to, Alan, to him before. I felt so sorry for that kid. I really did. And, and so when I, uh, the orders had been cut for us to go to, to, the, uh, Europe, uh, to the Pacific end of the war that was going on, and, uh, and my name was not on it. And he came and told me that your name's not on that. And I said, did you ask it be on it, uh, on the list to go or the list to stay and go as, as a cadre to Camp Gordon, Georgia, to train other? And he said, well, I didn't have an opportunity. He got on the phone call, Washington, and got the orders, and I went with that first sergeant that I chewed out, and he chewed me out back to Camp Gordon, Georgia. So I was with a cadre group to train others. And How long were you we at uh, Camp Gordon? Oh, about... Um, about a year, I guess, pushing the year. And that's where you and Charlotte married? Uh, well, yeah, I went to, she was in Washington, D.C. at the time, working for the War, uh, war Department. And uh, I, we I got married in Rockville, Maryland. All right, and you were, after Fort Gordon, where did you go with the military? We went, landed in Stockport uh, in England, stayed there for quite, uh, I guess, oh, six or eight months and trained the they, the, they had not invaded the continent at that point in time. D-Day had not arrived. And then we trained for a while at Henley on Thames, a resort area, a great area. I've been back once or twice since that time. And then just in, after the Battle of the Bulge, we were shipped over the, to, to maintain bridges on the Rhine. I was communications chief. Never could remember the Morse code. I don't see how in the world that they'd have somebody selected as chief. That, but it, it worked out all right. We strung some telephone wires and <laughs> did all right. Uh, so we went. We were, in, uh, of course, landed in France. Went through Belgium, Holland, uh, and into Germany. And I was in, in Germany for, um, I guess, uh, about uh, six to eight months. Uh, I was there when the war was over in, uh, in, in Germany. During your military career, you uh, were selected to go to Oxford University back in England, were you not? Yeah, they had a program, a training within civilian agencies, and that was why we were waiting to be shipped back home after the war was over. Uh, and, uh, they, and I was amazed at the few people who knew, we knew approximately how long we'd be there because you went according to points, the number of months, number of years, the area you'd served in, and so forth. And I made the application when I went down to the, it's a little red schoolhouse where they're signed uh, off. We, we, that's where I went to apply. And I believe there were five people other than myself from a battalion that went down and applied. And, and so they called me back the next day and said, you have your choice. You can go to Oxford, you can go to the Sorbonne, or you can go to the, what's the great university in Sweden, one, one other place. So I chose Oxford, and uh, they flew me over, and I stayed there for one, one full term and enjoyed it greatly. What did you study at Oxford? So we studied history of the of common law, jurisprudence, uh, just the contracts, just the basic history of law, and I had a professor there named Hart. He was in the First World War and uh, he was teaching jurisprudence. And uh, he had stayed after the war in England, married, stayed in England, and he, he was one great human being uh, and a great teacher. We, they, you, didn't, you didn't talk in class there. It was all straight lecture. You had a tutor you'd meet with twice a week, and he'd go over what you had supposedly learned or should have learned during the, uh, the week. It's a marvelous method. 
Had you already made up your mind at that point that you were going to become a lawyer? I made up my mind when I was seven years old I was going to be a lawyer. Tell me how that came about. Well, the, the, in, in, before we went to the eighth grade, uh, there was uh, memory books. I couldn't afford one, so I didn't have one. But, if, but my, school, my first grade school teacher's son had one, and they were writing what they wanted to be or what they were going to be. And uh, so he wanted me to write something in his book, and I did, and he wanted to write what I would be. And I said, I'm going to be a lawyer. I didn't even know how to spell it, to tell you the truth about it. And that's, that's literally the truth. I, I hoped that I'd get a hold of that book sometime, but it was misplaced. But well, I was seven at the time. Prior to, uh, to uh, going to college, say, had you ever met any lawyers? No, I, I, my cousin yes. that was yes. the only one that I had met other than, yes, right, uh, and I was that witness, and the, the Davises out of uh, Wartburg were quite well-known lawyers in East Tennessee. I had met uh, the one that tried the case, of right. course. You have uh, stated two instances here that I want to ask you if they have not sort of predicted the course of your professional career. One is that you got in a dispute with the administration at Lincoln Memorial University about the working conditions of the farmhands. And that seems to me presaged, uh, or if not predicted, your long and distinguished career as a labor lawyer. It, it did have some influence, that and one, one other aspect of it. Uh, the, um, uh, of course, I, I had to leave. We, I had eight brothers and sisters still in school, and somebody had to help support the family. No insurance, no nothing uh, to help uh, the family. So that I left California. That had some considerable influence, in, uh, yes. Uh, and uh, when I left to go to California, I, in order to get enough money to eat on going out, I worked at the American Aluminum Company in Alcoa and made $18 a week shoveling that hot metal into a 5,000 degree furnace to remelt it. And when I went out to California, I got a job within a month making $75 a week and I was filthy rich, I'll tell you. I sent my mother and the family $50 every payday. And then later on, I bought a war bond, a, a, week, a, a, a war, war bond a month as well. So it worked out fine. The other thing you have said earlier that it seems to me is an indicator, if not a predictor, of uh, your future career as a lawyer is when you went uh, to the defense of the underdog in the form of the soldier who was being uh, treated unfairly by the uh, sergeant. Uh, your uh, defense of the underdog uh, over the course of your career is quite well known to most people and would you say that that was one of the beginnings of your concern about the uh, defense of the powerless? Well that had quite a bit to do with it. My mother was a very fundamentalist uh, from the standpoint of religion and teaching. Uh, my father was not uh, too inclined to be religious. But we, we lived according to the golden rule, literally, as far as my mother was concerned. And we were taught very early on to help anybody that can help. And of course, uh, I, I don't, we weren't able to help much, but we, had, we, we went and worked on other people's property when they were sick and things of that sort. So I grew up. Uh, with a very strong feeling toward those who could not help themselves because there were so many out there uh, where, where I grew up. And of course, one, one additional thing that uh, I might mention, when I went to California and jumped from $18 a week to uh, 75 a week, when I left Alcoa, they were trying to form a union there and, uh, I, the, the, and the people were just so powerless and so afraid because jobs were really scarce and uh, of course American Aluminum Company was not paying a great deal but it was a great deal for that area and I, I, would, I tried to help them a little on that before I left. I was just there a few weeks 
And then I went to California, of course, that was all union. And uh, so uh, I, it, it impressed me that if you got representation, that you have some power. If you don't have, standing alone, you have no power, no hope of preserving or increasing uh, the benefits that might come to you. And uh, it did have, a, that had a tremendous influence on my attitude. Now you finished college and got your college degree at George Washington University. Yeah, when I came back from the Army. And how long were you at George Washington? I was there for one, I believe they were on the semester system. They let me take, the normal was, was uh, 18 to 21 hours. They, by special permission, after a lot of pushing and prodding, they let me take 25 hours and uh, so I could finish in the one term. And while I was doing that also, I was giving tests. I worked for the psychology department of the university, uh, giving aptitude tests and so forth for the soldiers that were coming back. And I never was impressed with the, the IQ test and the now, You were re reunited with Charlotte during oh, that yes, period yes. of time. Mm -hmm. But no children yet? No, no. All right. How did you select Vanderbilt University Law School? Well, I had heard when I was, uh, before I got out of high school, uh, I believe that uh, Jim Johnson had got me, uh, encouraged me to go to Lincoln Memorial University, uh, had mentioned it to me that that was the best law school anywhere in the South. Uh, and uh, of course, I didn't have any hope that I'd be able to go to Vanderbilt because it requires substantial funding. But uh, I had heard of Vanderbilt and uh, as a result, I had set in my head that I'd find some way of going to Vanderbilt. And of course, the GI Bill of Rights came along and uh, paid all the way, paid us $95 a month and books and tuition and so forth. So it's God's and that's the greatest legislation that's been passed in this country. So when did you and Charlotte move to Nashville so you could attend Vanderbilt? In 1947, in the, uh, they, uh, Dean Kaufman was dean at the time, and I wrote, applied, and all of that sort of thing. And he wrote me back and said, we don't want you to start in the middle of a term. Uh, it'll be best, best for you to wait until the fall. Uh, so I said, well, I've been out of cir circulation for a long time. I need to get moving. He finally agreed, so we came down in February and started. And I went straight through uh, so summers and all and finished. So you went through in, what, two years? Yes, a little over two years. Uh, you said Dean Kaufman was the dean. Do you recall any of the other faculty members who were there when you, uh, uh, during your tenure? Uh, the teacher of, 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 of Fordham was, uh, I made the highest grade in the constitutional law that had been made in the university and later on Bill Harbison exceeded a little bit later on. Uh, uh, but uh, Fordham uh, was a t taught constitutional law. and. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the, I was very surprised myself uh, and received many accolades, if I may say so, uh, for getting the highest grade that had been given in, uh, in, in, the, in law school since it's op reopened. And that was constitutional law. And of course, I was I studied and was very much impressed with many of the decisions of the New Deal type of uh, governmental structure and society. And, a protection that uh, the Supreme Court had started to some extent to give the average person. How many women were in your law school class? There was two two women in the law school class, Bonnie Cowan and Kelly, as I call her, Judge uh, Cooper's wife. They married not long after that. There were two women in the law school. So you and Judge Cooper and Judge Cooper's to be wife were classmates. Yes, Vanderbilt. that is correct. Uh, but I, it was surprising, uh, and of course that's another thing that uh, impressed me, and I guess it's influenced to a large extent my mother, of, of how that, uh, that, uh, that, that women just were not permitted to participate or did not participate. My mother didn't participate in, in politics or anything of that sort because it just wasn't a thing to do back uh, in the 20s. Well, we're going to get to your political career shortly, but uh, you struck a blow for the freedom of women once you got in a position to do something about it, did you not? 
Uh, yes, uh, I, well, I, when I got out of Vanderbilt, the uh, judge, later to be Judge High, and the group got together and, and I was had finished and came to me and said, you're going to run for the legislature. And I said, I've lived here less than three years. I, I, don't, I'm, I have not, had no experience in politics. I know nothing about it. I didn't say it in those words because I couldn't express it very well then. Uh, but they brought a petition, filed it, and I ran for the legislature. And one, uh, one uh, it, between Bev Briley had a ticket and Ben West had a ticket, and I ran as an independent. And uh, I, I was a solid Democrat and still am, but I ran as an independent. Well, you're a little more than a solid Democrat, aren't you? You're a yellow dog. <laughs> you got it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm a true New Deal Democrat, <laughs> you can bet. And I've got plenty of reason for being that hey, way. You have never varied from that line since uh, being born in Morgan County. You never one, never one step away. What is a yellow dog Democrat? It is one that would vote for a Democrat if it was a yellow dog. <laughs> All right, but the I, candidate were a yellow uh, dog. I think I interrupted you about the, your uh, the action that you took in the legislature for yeah, the benefit uh, of women. And I want to come back to LMU on one point, just for the heck of it. But uh, yes, and, and I was elected by 81 votes. Beat Harry Mitwitty, who was a Bev Briley fan. At that point in time, uh, Bev uh, Briley became my friend till his day he died. Uh, th through that effort, I met Silliman Evans Sr., whom I admired unendingly in his running the Tennessean. Uh, but since I beat his, he, he was supporting Briley Group. And uh, um, uh, right, right after I won, we had our first child, Kay Brandstetter. And so I went out to the hospital. And uh, that hospital room was just flooded with flowers all over. And I went in, just dumbfounded, and I said, who, who, who sent all these? Said, Silliman Evans and the Tennessean. <laughs> so, and he, 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 he supported me on anything I did because I was doing what he was doing. And he was, he was one of my, uh, I admire him as much as most any person I knew all right. or have known. Right. Now, in the legislature, uh, what legislation did you? Uh, well, uh, I was appointed uh, chairman of the labor committee because I still had my inclinations to try to work in that field. Uh, I saw many things happening. Uh, women couldn't serve on juries, which surprised me unendingly that they were not permitted, legally prohibited from serving <laughs> on juries. And so uh, I, uh, Asta Underwood, who was a Republican, but a fairly good one, uh, but she was working in women's rights field, and there were not many people doing that in, in 1950 and 51. And so I, I proposed a bill that women would be permitted to serve on juries, not, not required to. They could, if they were subpoenaed for jury service, they could simply say over the phone, I choose not to serve. But that's the best we could get at the time. And, and that, I believe, only passed by one vote in the House, as I remember. Uh, so uh, we did get it passed, and from that, of course, has grown in many other participa participants and uh, women's activities and pushing to, for some equality in that area. Uh, they've come a long way. They've come a long way, baby, thank goodness. All right. Let's go back to Vanderbilt Law School for Can a minute. Can I mention one thing yes. that was amusing in a way, and I guess it's something, but Lincoln Memorial University, uh, the because of my little controversy with the administration, thought that I'd just about as well not apply for the fourth year. And uh, so <laughs> that's and then I went to, on to California anyway. But this spring, I was invited to give the commencement address at the university in which I relayed that story <laughs> as a part of my, my talk. And of course, attack corporate welfare unendingly in that. And some of the, they've got some very rich people, New York on the board, and they was looking around at me. But the students were just standing up raging <laughs> on the part of attack on corporate welfare. <laughs> uh, Let, but go ahead, I'm sorry. Now, let's go back to Vanderbilt for, for just a minute. Uh, I know you won't uh, say this about yourself, so I'm going to say it for you. Okay. While you were at Vanderbilt, you were president of the student body, the law school student body. Yes. You were president of the Honor Council. Yes. 
you were president of Delta Theta Phi Legal Fraternity, and you were the note editor of the Vanderbilt Law Review. Yes. And you did all of that within a two-year period. Mm -hmm. Now, one other question about Vanderbilt. Were there any minority students in Vanderbilt at the time you were there? I don't think there was a, a single black person in the school, is my recollection. Undergraduate or graduate? No, I, I certainly in the law school there was not. There may have been, but I don't recall uh, whether or not there, there were uh, uh, minorities of any kind, mostly inclu including women, certainly in the law school, just the two. But, I want to talk just a moment here about your children. Mm -hmm. uh, Kay is the oldest. Yes. And the next one is? Is, uh, is Linda. She was up in Kentucky. She yeah. was down this weekend. Right. And what does Linda do? Well, she, she was worked with for the, in the Ephraim McDowell Cancer Research Center and raised, I believe it's 30 million over a fairly reasonable short period of time, and they have completed most of that cancer center. She's still in public relations. Right. And what does Kay, the Kay, eldest Kay, she is, uh, is, she is uh, uh, the librarian, chief librarian at Harpeth Valley School. And the next child was was Jane, Janie. I, I refer to her name as Jane. And the and the baby was is Dewey. Dewey. Of course, Janie is in our office, and uh, I must uh, do an editorial here. She is an exceptionally bright and good lawyer, right. and so is her brother Dewey. Right. That's what I wanted to ask you about. We we talked about your career at Vanderbilt, and I know that Jane and Dewey also went to Vanderbilt. They did order the coif, both of them. And I'd like for you to comment, if you have any views, on how the Vanderbilt Law School education they received compares with the Vanderbilt Law School education that you received. Well, uh, there's hardly a comparison, <laughs> realistically. Uh, the, um, of course, it was limited uh, uh, number of courses taught immediately after the war. All the, all the basics were taught. Very few electives. Uh, the, uh, uh, it, 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 they just uh, build in just very little way that you can compare. It's so st strangely different and better frankly, than it was when I went there. Vanderbilt has an exceptionally good law school. It was a good law school then, but they have progressed and, and branched out into so many different areas of law that were not then uh, being taught at Vanderbilt. And the, Vanderbilt has undertaken so many, in my judgment, tremendously important programs uh, uh, in writing, in, uh, all that sort of thing that uh, and and the professors just uh, I think are much better than the ones when I went to school there. Well, we're going to take a break here in just a minute, but first I want to ask you when did you pass the bar and how did that relate to when you finished law school? Well, the, back then you you could take the Tennessee bar examination prior to graduating from law school. And I took it in February and actually didn't get out of law school until June, July, I believe. And they permitted us, when we passed the bar, to come down and get appointed uh, to, in criminal cases, to uh, represent uh, indigent uh, people. And uh, I, I was impressed with the lack of due process there. I mean, I was appointed one time, I recall, I'll speed it up on that, but to uh, represent someone who'd stole a ham from a prominent citizen in town. Uh, and uh, the judge, uh, Judge Hart, uh, said, you're appointed, take him outside, talk to him, be back in five minutes. And so I came back at uh, uh, five minutes, and the judge said, have you reached a decision? I said, Judge, I haven't even had time to find out a thing in the world about this man. Well, he said, he's going to enter a plea right now. And uh, I'll give you two minutes to go back and see what you're going to do. Well, I went back, and again, I said, came back in, and I said, uh, Judge, I haven't had time. To, I don't uh, he, to give this man any discussion about what to do or how to do or how to plead. Well, he says he wants to plead guilty, doesn't he? And this fellow said, well, I did steal a ham. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that man got eight years in the penitentiary. 
I don't think he served at all. As we lawyers tend to uh, say rather automatically, just for the record, when did you finish, uh, or when were you admitted to the bar? In uh, 1949, in, um, let's see, in, fe in February, I took the bar, and shortly after that we got notice right back in February of 1949. And where did you first start to work? What was your first position? Uh, the, uh, I had met Arthur Crownover, who had revised Gibson Suits and Chancery uh, the, while I was in law school. And he arranged, we, we became friends. His daddy had been on the Court of Appeals, but was then dead. And we arranged, we lived across the hall on apartments, in an apartment, a converted house over on Pierce, right what, what Vanderbilt owns now, that area. And uh, he had asked me to, uh, to told me that I could come and sit in the, their uh, reception room and uh, see what, how law practice began, how it started. And also, I was checking all the citations to be sure they were correct. For, Gib for the revision of Gibson Suits and Chancery. I'd done a little bit of that before I got out of law school. Uh, it was something that he wanted me to do, and uh, I didn't get paid, but I didn't expect to be paid. Uh, but it, uh, I helped him in that respect. And a slight amount of rewriting, very little, but he did all the rewriting. When did you first actually start the practice of law as opposed to the editing work? Uh, well, after, after, immediately after that, as I recall, uh, I, Alf Rutherford, who was circuit court clerk, the Rutherford family was uh, famous in the practice of law here, many other lawyers. Uh, the, the, uh, I, I was, and I was interested in politics, uh, frankly, and as you know, uh, led the parade down Nashville with a torch lit parade for Keith Oliver the first time he ran for, for the U.S. Senate. Uh, but I, the, I worked for between three and six months, I'm not sure how, how long, uh, was employed, was paid by the National Young Democrats to s seek to organize uh, clubs or organizations in Arkansas, Tennessee, and Alabama. So I did that for three to six months, I don't recall how long it was. And uh, then uh, Roe Folk, who was in law school with me, we were in the same fraternity. His father had been uh, control, control of the state of Tennessee at one time, historically. And so he and I got together and opened a, took one room in the Stallman building, put a petition across that room, and uh, that was our office for some considerable period of time. And that's when I really got to practicing law as such. What did you make the first year, if you recall? Less than $600. And hopefully it got a little better as time went by. Yes, it, uh, it doubled for many years. <laughs> and how did you get clients? Well, the, uh, the, the, actually we were, it was a practice at that time that lawyers would go to the criminal courts and that's where I represented a fellow that got took, and I was about to ready to quit practicing law at that point. But <laughs> got eight years in a pen for seal and a ham. Uh, but we'd go over and be appointed, and we would represent the indigent de defendants, and that's how that they started practicing. Actually, you never got paid. I, I think one of them paid me twenty-five dollars once, another one fifty dollars, or something of that sort, but very, very little. And then, uh, of course, I was in a goodly number of organizations in town, uh, and as a result, I started getting referrals as a result of church activity, uh, community service activity, and various uh, organizations, uh, conservation league, and things of that sort. Now and you just gradually built it up. You built a substantial labor law practice. How did you first start your labor law practice? Well, when I was in the legislature, uh, I was appointed to the labor committee and uh, actually got the uh, so-called right to work law of Tennessee on the floor. It failed by, by five votes being repealed. 
and it hadn't been back on the floor since. So as a result of that, I came in contact with Stanton Smith, who was head of the teachers union in the state, and various other people, and they started referring me uh, cases, and that's how I actually got into the labor law field. What was your overhead the first year or so you practiced? Well, the, uh, I think that we were paying a uh, hundred dollars for the uh, between us, row folk and myself, fifty dollars a month each for the area that we were in, and we had uh, one telephone line in and one telephone on each desk. It wasn't as big a room; it wasn't a bit bigger than this room, if that big. Did you have a secretary? No, not to begin with. How did you do your pleadings? In that? Uh, we uh, we had uh, we would I'd get some one of Arthur's crown over secretaries occasionally to do it. Row folk could type. I couldn't, even though I was company clerk in the army. I couldn't. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't type. And then we did get a secretary for about six months after we got together. Did you expand your firm over a period of time? Well, the he and Row and I stayed together. Then later on. Uh, we went, uh, we uh, had uh, Crown Over, it was Watkins and Crown Over when I was in, sitting in their reception room. Then Watkins died and Arthur Crown Over, Roe Folk and myself formed a firm. But what Watkins was that? Uh, the, he was, um, he was not uh, the, I've forgotten his first name to tell you the truth, Tom, Tom Watkins. Tom Watkins. Right. And he, he, he did exclusively insurance defense work. Uh, and as a result of what little I saw, I decided never to get in that field. What uh, changes occurred in that firm as the time went well, by? Well, as time went on, then uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Moore, his, uh, Moore, Crown over Brandstetter and Folk. Then it, uh, as time went on, it became uh, Brandstetter and Folk, the Brandstetter Folk and um, uh, uh, let's see, the, I, I was trying to keep it in sequence, and uh, I wrote it down, but I don't have it uh, at all. But eventually, it, the firm is now Branster, Kilgore, Stranch, and Jennings. Stranch is my son-in-law and, and Janie's husband. And uh, so it, it's changed. I, it's been Branstetter and some others uh, all through the period of time. So Janie and Dewey are now your partners in the that, practice. That is so correct. Far. How have you found... Uh, uh, practicing law with your children? Uh, it, it is absolutely delightful. It is delightful. Their mother did a good job in raising those children, I'll tell you. <laughs> Who is in the firm today besides you and Janie and Dewey? We, we, had, uh, we have, of course, in Jim Stranch, and, uh, the, and uh, of course, uh, the, the um, Carol Kilgore. Carol Kilgore and, and Jennings is still there. Is a very good lawyer. Uh, we represent uh, American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, Screen Actress Gill, and so forth. And they do most of that work. I did it originally and organized, helped them organize the. They had six members when the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists came to town, and I have what five thousand now or something of that sort. Tremendous expansion. Let's go back to the first year you started practicing law and talk about the Nashville Bar at that point. How many lawyers would you estimate were members of the Nashville Bar? I, it was somewhere in the neighborhood of a hundred, I would guess, and I, and I would, could speak to uh, the names of every one of them for a few years after that if I met them on the street. And 90% of the officers were located up and down Union Street? Right. I'd say the biggest portion of the oh yes, they are, uh, most all of the officers were, and a large number, of course, were, this, were in the Stallman building. Right. How many circuit and chancery courts were in the courthouse at that time? Well, it, uh, let's see, they were, uh, on, I believe there's only two, uh, I think we only had one chancellor when I first started, and then we had two circuit courts. And uh, as I believe, either two or three General Sessions judges at that point in time. The General Sessions Court. Oh, we did have the two criminal judges. Two criminal excuse judges. me, yes. The General Gilbert, uh, Judge Gilbert, and Judge Hart. The General Sessions Courts were a fairly new thing, were they? Yes, yes, they were. And uh, I, of course, I, uh, Judge Todd, who was later on the Court of Appeals, was uh, and uh, was uh, on the bench at that time. 
Do you recall your first client? Uh, yes, uh, the uh, the I don't know how whether I got appointed in this some manner in this or not, but there's a black man that had one leg with crutch. He walked around and got into my office some way, and I honestly don't recall how he got there, who sent him or what. But it was a divorce situ divorce situation, and uh, he was uh, very outspoken. They had three children, three to five children. I don't remember how many. He and his wife. And he wanted me to file a petition to make his, the wife help support the children, which I did, file a petition requesting it, and I thought the statute permitted. And the uh, judge just practically laughed me out of court. He said, there is no such thing as a woman being required to support. That's a husband's responsibility. But uh, he, it's amazing. He'd, he'd come back and see me every once in a while, and, but we never got him an order to require his wife to help support. <laughs> Let's look at, say, the first five years of your law practice. What would you estimate would be the number of hours a day you worked? Well, uh, actually, uh, I became uh, so involved in, uh, I didn't have the business. Uh, I could have done what business, law business I did in two to three hours a day without any problem at all. As a matter of fact, many days, absolutely nothing to do as far as that's concerned. I did, the Rutherford started referring me a, a considerable number of small automobile damage cases, uh, which helped, helped us eat and that sort of thing and, and pay expenses. Uh, but uh, I, there, was, there was just no, not that much business at all. But I, as a result of that, I was in the American Legion, which I'm not so much involved in anymore, purposely, uh, and uh, various community activities, uh, conservation approach type things, and uh, church activity. And I was a bit more busy, in, far more busy in that than I was in the practice of law, even during the day, because there was always activities going on. Now, when you represented a client and charged a fee, did you charge uh, the client by the hour? Uh, no. That, the hourly concept came along much, much later. You charged him whatever you thought he could afford to pay. And if he couldn't pay, I didn't charge him, if I knew that to be a fact. And if, if, if I felt that he was being abused, I put it that way. I, half the people that I represented for the first five years, I would get no fee on at all. I got the satisfaction of trying to help somebody that needed help, couldn't get it otherwise, and there was no real situation in the bar like we have today to help or protect those who did not have representation. Of course, there was no public defender. Uh, that, that, that we'd been run out of town if we'd have proposed a public defender in those days to spend public money on defending those people, you know, that were in trouble. Uh, so uh, until the due process concepts came along and uh, they were being furnished, they were, they were not furnished with lawyers. They, lawyers were required to uh, accept appointments <clears throat> and should have accepted them. But you can see what happened, just like the ham man. There was, it was just a rat race to just, they're there, they're, they're guilty, send them on, do it in a hurry, get it over with. And unfortunately, was it not uh, your view that there could be substantial abuse of people by lawyers who insisted on being paid when they were supposed to be working for nothing? That, that's true, yes. They, uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was hurtful to someone, uh, uh, and I don't say this in any boasting manner at all, seriously I don't, but when, uh, if you have a feeling for humanity, when you have a feeling for human beings, for you have a, when you have a feeling, and I grew up that way, when you have a feeling for people who can't help themselves, then to see that person abused, mistreated, not receive any protection whatsoever, it, it, it is just a horrible thing. And it was horrible back then as far as I'm concerned. Looking back on it, it's, it's much worse than I thought it was at that point in time, and I thought it was bad enough then. Let's shift gears for a moment, Cecil, and talk about your government service. Now, we talked about your election to the legislature and passage of the, uh, of the statute permitting women to serve as jurors. Uh, you also were involved in the repeal of the poll tax, were you not? Uh, yes, and that's one thing I remembered where I grew up, because the people running for office, and that was, uh, uh, I remember we were sitting out on the front porch one time, my mother and father and several of the brothers and sisters, and a candidate for uh, uh, some, uh, some office, county office, came by 
and said, I'm coming by to, uh, to give you poll, uh, poll tax receipts if you'll vote for me. The poll tax was $2. And you couldn't vote without a poll tax. Well, what, what was the poll tax? It was just, it, it was an effort to, to uh, in large measure, started out uh, in large measure to prevent people from voting. If you didn't have $2, you couldn't vote unless you agreed to send your vote. And that got to be a common practice when I was growing up. And I can remember uh, my mother, who was not political at all, my, uh, at all, my father uh, just ordered that man out of our yard. And I was really impressed then uh, with that approach because you don't, didn't sell votes. But you go over and you'd see them handing out at the polls. And I visited the polls at the Deer Lodge when I was, say, 10, 15. Just, I think just happened to be there, and they sang out front, handing out poll tax to those who would agree to vote for them. It was a, a, an abusive sort of thing. But we, uh, Sanders Angler, and I put in a bill to repeal, actually, it, it resulted, uh, if you'd paid your poll tax so many years back, then you didn't have to pay it any time in the future. It was, uh, that poll tax failed year after year in the legislature to repeal it because politicians that were in, in control wanted to have that much control remain so that they could hand out poll tax receipts for people who was going to vote for them. So, and it had been tried over and over, and of course that was another thing. Silliman Evans, who was a publisher, editor, owner, publisher of the Tennessean, uh, when I was there, he asked me if I could come down to his office. And, uh, and he, they were editorializing against the poll tax. Uh, or rather, uh, they were known as too liberal a paper, but I liked them like they were. And so uh, the, that uh, we got together and got enough publicity and wrote it to where it would come along and, and repeal it. You never ran for public office again after serving in the legislature. Why not? Uh, actually, um, the... Uh, for some reason, I felt that I could be, I was too, really active, if I may say so, in uh, conservation of all sorts of community activities, council community uh, agencies, it's council community services now, and which was helping a lot of people, I thought. And, uh, uh, and I just didn't run. I think I may say this, that uh, Silliman Evans had asked me, with the, he had a big group to run, if I'd run for Congress when uh, Percy Priest died. And uh, I thought about it and told him, just very frankly, that I appreciated unendingly, but I just felt that I could be of more service uh, in the community than I could by running for Congress, even if I could be elected or not elected. There are many people who think that uh, one of your greatest contributions, insofar as government service is concerned, is the metropolitan government of Nashville and Davidson County. As a matter of fact, I've heard you introduced and I've heard you described by many, many people as the father of the metropolitan government of Nashville and Davidson County. How did you happen to become involved in the effort to uh, draft the charter and um, get it favorably approved by the voters? Well, when I was in the legislature, we passed, I believe it was called a community, uh, to finance and create a community services uh, not community services, but an organization to study the local government and, uh, and uh, made a small appropriation for that. A study was made over a period of time. As you know, it went over a period of 10 years before it was uh, actually enacted uh, finally. But I became interested in that. Uh, Bev Briley was tremendously interested in it. Uh, Tennessean was tremendously interested in even the banner was I interested in some sort of uh, combination for a while they pulled off later but uh, I became interested in uh, consolidating the government it just seemed to me uh, it was so foolish and uh, if I may say so maybe improperly stupid to think that you're going to have two school systems two park systems two police systems two road systems two everything with all the hangers on and all the political patronage it was involved in each of those not to have one form, one government in, in Davidson County. And I just, I really felt strongly about it. And so I was interested and worked with it right on through. You, uh, you currently serve as the uh, chairman of the uh, Charter Commission. The you? Charter Revision Commission. Charter we revision placed commission. a provision in the charter uh, to have a, the mandatory to create a Charter Revision Commission appointed by the mayor and approved by the council to study the charter and propose amendments if they decided that some were necessary. Uh, and uh, I've been chairman of that. Carmack Cochran 
I was a very fine human being. He he was a, he was a chair of that for a while, and then I became chair. Who initially appointed you to the commission? Uh, I was appointed realistically by Bill Briley. See, they they appointed. Uh, what year was that? Do you recall? Uh, the there had been fifty-seven, I believe, when it was first. When the commission, when the first, well, first we had to get an act through the. Uh, uh, actually, real, realistically, it was very difficult. We had to get basically a constitutional amendment, and uh, we had to get an act through the legislature to authorize one government as a result for Davidson County. So there was a lot of work preliminary to the creation of the Charter Commission Act, and uh, the and uh, Bev Briley was the one that uh, we, you see. We had two. Two commissions. One, the first um, metropolitan government draft of the charter failed in the county, passed in the city. Then we got another act through the legislature, and by that, at that time, the old, some of the old members were reappointed by legislative act to the new second commission, and I was appointed to, to request a Bev Briley on that. He was county judge then, county what is county executive today. And it, and it passed the second vote. Passed the second vote. Okay. Mm -hmm. and the first vote, the Tennessee and, and the Banner both supported. The, uh, the second vote, Tennessee and supported, the Banner opposed it. And what about West and Briley? I mean, they switched. Oh, yeah, now, West switched from for it to being against metropolitan government. Second time around. Second time around. Both of them were for it before. They're political organizations, both newspapers. How long from the first conceptualization of the Metropolitan Government Charter until its actual passage? How many years? It will come into effect of 57, 57 to 63, realistically. All right. it, it, it was approved in April 19th or eight, in April of 63. Right. You also served on the Metro Action Commission. Uh, yes, uh, that was the, the poverty agency. That was the poverty agency, or the the uh, Johnson administration uh, to eliminate poverty, and uh, and it did a lot of good. It didn't do half as much good as it should have. Who it, appointed it, you to that commission? Uh, actually, I was appointed by Bri Briley to that. You served on the Metro Human Relations Commission. Yes, I served um, several years, and then they abolished it later on, and then now they've recreated. it. Who appointed you to that position? I'm quite sure Briley was right. still in at that point right. in time. You uh, have been active in a number of community endeavors in addition to the ones that we've already discussed. Uh, you alluded earlier to the uh, Council of Community Agencies. You were the president of that? Uh, yes, that, that was, it's now called Count, uh, Council of Community Services, and I was president of that for some time. And you have served as a member of the board of the American Civil Liberties Union? Yes. Uh, and you alluded to your environmental activities or your conservation activities. You served for a number of years as president of the Tennessee Conservation League, did you? Yes, uh, I, I was president of the Tennessee Conservation League and president of the Davidson County Sportsman Society organization. Now, now we haven't even gotten to your professional activities yet, yeah. but how have you managed to take the time to be a successful lawyer as everybody would concede that you are? I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> How have you managed to be a successful lawyer and engage in all of these community and governmental activities? Well, actually, uh, 10 hours to 12 hours a day, um, or most of the point at times of neglecting the family, which uh, was, is not good. No lawyer should do that. I don't think I did it to their detriment because I have a wonderful wife and certainly four tremendously great children and 10 great grandchildren, great-grandchildren, which are uh, a, a real joy, and all of them, uh, thank goodness, take after the mother. I've got one that's going to go to medical school, and another two of them more to law school, and uh, uh, so I'm, uh, I may hope I'm justified, but I'm very proud of uh, how Charlotte raised the children. You know, up until this point, it seems to me running through our entire discussion is that concept that uh, your mother and father gave you back in those depression years in Morgan County, Tennessee, 
because your entire career has revolved around a feeling of responsibility to help others. Is that, is that a generally accurate description? I, I'd say that that is very accurate and it is an overriding, uh, uh, I feel guilty just horribly guilty if I'm not out trying to help somebody if they need help. Now I will concede in more recent, very recent years because I've got to, I love to farm, I've done a little more farming than I, and less community activity the last 10 years than I used to. Uh, but uh, uh, you just have to come into this world somewhere or other with it in your heart. And, and I think that that very, very early training uh, an observation of seeing people in real trouble. Now, I don't know what I'd have done if I'd lived in the cities where they were starving. We didn't starve, uh, but uh, it, it was ju I was just impressed ever since I can remember. I know that's not something that I planned at all in any sense of the word. It's just something that happens. Now, let's turn for a moment to your activities in, on behalf of the profession. Not to say that all of your activities up to now haven't really been on behalf of the profession. They certainly have been to the glory of the profession. Well, now, there were many people who didn't think that way when I was representing the Vietnam protesters. I understand, the we're, we're, we're going to come to that in just a minute. Uh, you, have, uh, you have served uh, uh, on the Board of Professional Responsibility, and you served as the chairman of the Supreme Court's Board of Professional and, Responsibility. And you know what a hard job that is. You've been there. What? Uh, how do you view that from your perspective of having seen the old system and, and having served as chairman of the board under what I refer to as the new system? Well, uh, actually, the old system, uh, I think we have changed tremendously from the old system to gradually to the new system, which uh, uh, I, I don't think it's because of age or anything that I respected the old system. Lawyers, most of the lawyers that I associated with in the first several years of law practice uh, had a great deal of feeling, uh, not, I don't think as much as I did, but for the underdog, f f feeling for the, uh, the profession. It, it was truly a glorious opportunity to be a lawyer. I'm not sure that is as true as it should be today. And they, they were just uh, the courteous, courtesy, respect one to the other, total respect for the courts. Well, I, I, I thought the judges were gods when I first started practice law, uh, substantially. You know, it's just that sort of feeling. And that sort of feeling doesn't exist today. I'm not sure that it should exist as it did early on, but there should have been some remnants left over to care on to this day of that type of respect and dedication and feeling. And, and there was more feeling for community service early on. You don't find, if you just take the bar today as a whole and start asking what organizations do you belong to? What are you doing in your community, church-wise, government-wise, uh, Boy Scout, Girl Scout? And I find that it's very difficult uh, to get people to, ser to serve in those areas that are so needed, and lawyers are the best people in the world and the, and the best qualified. Why do you think that's changed? Uh, you, you'll excuse me, just greed, I think. The whole system, corporate system in this country has got to where it's, it's just a question of how much can I make, who can I take it from, what can I get? And lawyers, uh, some way or other, have fallen into more of that than they should. Speaking of judges, let me ask you this. Name two or three of, of, of the truly great judges that you have appeared before during your career. Uh, the, uh, uh, of course, the judges that uh, that I've, uh, they may be, may be some considerable disagreement with that. Judge Taylor in Knoxville, uh, uh, federal judge, I thought was a very, very good judge. Although he was abrupt, uh, he had just about held me in contempt once. Uh, but he, he was, when he got to it, I, he did a good job, but he was, he was too rude to lawyers. But he would still come down most of the time on the right side. Uh, the, uh, we, we've had... Uh, Excuse me, uh, that yeah. would be the Brandstetter side, right? <laughs> 
let me let me run this one real fast. <laughs> one time uh, he'd give me uh, some problems. One time I, I got up at, uh, to argue a point of dis on the dismissal of a case and racing of Knoxville. It was on, happened to be on my side, but usually on different sides. But he argued first, and and Judge Taylor, you know, he leaned over the bench and he'd do this, and and he'd, he'd say, "No use in you getting up here, Brian Stetter. If people come up here from Nashville." try to lecture me, and I'm just, well, sit down, I'm going to hear you. And I said, now, Judge, you've got a right to be heard. So he said, uh, he said, I made up my mind, I'm not going to dismiss this case. And so I said, well, would, would you give me two minutes? I started, and I finished about a minute and a half, said, you can sit down, you win. <laughs> now, that's the type of judge he was. And from then on, and I'd had trouble with him in other cases, from then on, he was a great, great friend. The bar associations, he would seek me out, or I'd seek him out, you know. Uh, and uh, of course, Judge Morton turned into a very good judge. Judge Morton and I had uh, serious scrapes to begin with when he first came to the bench here in Nashville. But he turned out to be an exceptionally good judge, and uh, uh, it's amazing how he learned. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me uh, <clears throat> some of the truly great lawyers that you have tried cases with or that uh, you have opposed? Well, uh, a sad story on part of that. Tommy Osmond was an exceptionally good lawyer. We're going to come to the Hoppe okay, case good, in just a good. minute. Okay. Uh, the, uh, of course, uh, John Hooker was a good lawyer, tremendously good lawyer. Jack Norman was a tremendously good lawyer in the criminal field. Uh, in the civil in the in the civil field, you don't seem to get the publicity, you know, that would go, permeate the community like the, in the criminal law practice. Uh, uh, Taylor, you, uh, uh, Frank Taylor, who helped me a great deal and who was ultra conservative, and just just fell over when I did some legislation that he didn't like, but still was a friend. Was was a, a great criminal lawyer when I first started practicing law here. Harding, uh, not ha you know, no relation Carl to Carl Harding. Carl Harding and Frank Taylor teamed up a lot, uh, and that was in the criminal law field. They were both state senators. Yes, as, they, as a matter of fact, uh, they they were on the tickets of the of, uh, of, of of when I ran for the legislature, and they they broke rank and supported me uh, for when I ran for the legislature. I want to put us on rewind a minute because I have overlooked one of the major events in your career and that was when you first started practicing law you and some other lawyers started the first bar review course is that correct uh, yes I, the, the uh, when I was still in school uh, the uh, I'd received shall we say a little respect but getting a big grade you know it got traveled around uh, but uh, when I when, when I was in school the I started a bar review course my last year there, just to help lawyers that uh, needed help. Whit Lafon, who is uh, Albert Gore's uh, brother-in-law, uh, was... The vice president's uncle. Uh, he, he, right. Uh, was um, uh, having troubles. And so I spent night after night, and he won't like me for this, but I didn't think he'd ever make past the bar. <laughs> uh, but he turned out became a circuit judge later on, DA down there, a wonderful, wonderful human being. But I, I helped him more than others. There's four or five others uh, and uh, that uh, I, I'd helped. And uh, at their request, we just got together and started having kind of bull sessions. And then when I got out and, uh, and started, I went to Bill Harbison and Val Sanford and I then really put together uh, outlines and, and taught, I guess, about five years. And Vanderbilt gave us a space. And I think we got either 25 or $50 per person that attended uh, that bar uh, review course. And uh, I we thoroughly enjoyed it. I was privileged to be a student back at that time. And I remember the outlines were all mimeographed. They were, right. <laughs> and cited case after case after case. And I also remember that many young lawyers after they passed the bar, who couldn't afford a library, would use the outlines as a library until they could get law books. Well, I, I used them myself because <laughs> it saved a lot of research. But we, we enjoyed that. And then it got to where we all three of us were getting fairly busy and uh, decided to drop it. And then who was it came in from Knoxville and made a, a fortune uh, and still doing it, <laughs> bar review courses. 
Now, Cecil, let's talk for a minute about some of your most famous cases. Um, as I indicated earlier, you've always had the reputation of being for the underdog, and certainly I think uh, you, uh, in our discussion here today, have clearly demonstrated that you've always been for the underdog whether it be professionally, politically, or community-wise. And some of uh, your more famous cases uh, involved representation of the underdog, did they not? I would think so, yes. And I want to start with the Highlander Folk School case. Can you tell us a little bit about that case and how you got involved and some of the people who were involved in it? Well, up at Mont Eagle, uh, they Miles Horton, who had a PhD and a lot of training in Europe and various universities, uh, started out uh, ha having an adult educational program. And that program originally started uh, with uh, trying to educate miners and help the miners up in the coal mines of that area. It later uh, start, uh, progressed along in various channels and got to be basically civil rights, uh, women's rights. Uh, and so forth, and they, there came a time when uh, they were having the adult educational programs going, mostly civil rights. Uh, and uh, the, Miles Horton was still, still running it. And they would have people come in and lecture. Uh, I know that, uh, for example, when, when the case was going on, we had people from North Carolina, PhDs, and so forth. And Swanee, some of the Swanee professors were brave uh, that's where Martin Luther King came up there, and with uh, Septima Clark, and uh, the legislature had an investigation. Uh, Attorney General of Arkansas Bennett and somebody from Alabama uh, uh, was opposing, trying to get their charter revoked. They were communists, they were everything in the world that they were not, you know, uh, but they were very liberal in their approach to things. And Ellington was governor. Certainly liberal for that time. Really, not for today, probably, but for that time. So Ellington and the legislature got together and held some hearings. Now, Ellington, you mean Governor Gov Buford governor, Ellington? Yeah, Buford Ellington. And uh, they passed a resolution requesting that uh, the charter be revoked and that a hearing be held. Ab Sloan was the attorney general at that time. So they, highway, they set the highway patrol up to raid the place, saying that they were selling beer at the, at the school and specifically were letting whites and blacks sit in the same classroom. That was a specific charge. Now, what year was it? That was 56, no, it, it was in the late 50s or early 60s, actually. Uh, and, and so they raided and they, they didn't find anything, but particularly claimed they found some, uh, some kegs or some bottles that had had whiskey in them, but it was none, no whiskey there. And, but they, they raided them, pushed them around, Septima Clark, who was well known in the area of, of civil rights and civil liberties. Uh, they t hauled her off to jail and they pushed them pretty, pretty s severely. Uh, got a search warrant, which the judge later said was clearly Ill illegal on its face, and it was. But nonetheless, they filed the suit to revoke the charter. And we tried the case over a jury case. Judge Chatton was the judge at that time. He later became uh, yeah. on, uh, a justice on the Supreme Court. Yeah, case. right, up the li line. And so I've often said that, uh, uh, that Highlander Folk School got him promoted. <laughs> <laughs> it did, but uh, the, the they eventually revoked the charter, and uh, and and, uh, and, uh, and Chatton held that two things that they were Im Ill illegally selling beer. Of course, what they did, they were, the blacks could not go into town. They were absolutely arrested every time they went into Mont Eagle, uh, and, and they would take a they'd take a list of things, razor blades, and they did buy beer. They, they'd put up their money in a, in a cigar box and uh, their names is what they were getting, and then they'd send a white person in to get the, the, what they wanted, or was by paying for, and take it back and give it to them. And that constituted selling beer. That was one of the bases of the, uh, 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 well, they weren't selling beer at all, but that was one of the bases of it. So uh, the, uh, the other was that they let blacks and whites 
sit in the same classroom specifically. And that was a state statute says that blacks and whites don't sit in the same classroom at that point in time. And so that was the two bases upon which they revoked the charter. Now the Supreme Court got smart and knew that they couldn't stand on that business of blacks and whites because Brown Board of Education has already been decided. Of course this was private, it was not public. Uh, so they, they revoked the charter in any event and we had one ready to... Revoked it on the basis of selling beer? Selling beer and letting blacks and whites sit in the same classroom. <coughs> if you'll remember that was when they had big uh, billboards, uh, all about five places around Nash Nashville, with Martin Luther King's picture on it. The, the present subversive communists that are going to destroy the country is what I believe is the quote of what was they on. They also had to impeach Earl Warren. And P absolutely, impeach Earl Warren is right. <laughs> they sure did. <laughs> that was uh, <clears throat> Bennett of Arkansas. You uh, were involved uh, with a large number of women in a case in Fayetteville. Be careful how you say that. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, if, if, if Charlotte is going to see this, I'm asking you this as a lawyer that you were involved. Tell us she about, knows about it. it. Tell she us about one that trial. Case. Tell us about it. Actually, there was a, a ladies' garment factory in Fayetteville, Tennessee. Came in here from, from New York. They hired about 300 women and about four or five men. And of course, the divorce rate rate went up awfully just <laughs> in a little while. But they were the international ladies' garment worker. Dubinsky was head of it at that time. Dubinsky was a great friend of Kefauver's. And uh, the 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 women they, when they start trying to organize them, of course, that was a a no-no to have a labor union in that county. And as a matter of fact, we got pictures and quotes from the from officers who took two of the organizers out the county line, beat them up admitted this, admitted they did this. Federal government didn't interfere in those days in that type of deprivation and said if you ever come back into this county it'll be a lot worse. Both of them came back. It didn't get any worse as it happened because the women took over as they should ought to do <laughs> and, uh, and started uh, picketing. Uh, they arrested 300 women, put them in jail, all in the same, just jammed them in the jail, held them for two days without bond, and then they said, you can leave, with, we won't make you make bond. And they said, we're not going to leave, we're just going to stay, you done abuse us enough. And they tore that jail all to pieces. We paid $11,000 to repair it when those lawsuits were all over. Uh, but really, the, the problem was this. They, 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 we had a minimum wage law, I believe, of $3. No, it wasn't three dollars. It's two dollars and something an hour, and they could train uh, on a train on a training wage just a little over half of that uh, for six months, and so they would break down and segregate the various job classifications. And they, the way they were running it, they could keep a woman on that training scale for up to a year and a half to two years. And they just were not they was not going to put up with that, and uh, mm -hmm. so we, the, we they, they had about. 15 or 20 indicted for attempt to get, commit murder, just every sort of thing in the world. But it was, it was quite a, that's, that's an, another area that uh, my good friends at the Tennessean came down, they came down and took pictures and they were the ones that dug out the wording and admission by a deputy sheriff that they'd taken these two people out and of course the sheriff wasn't going to arrest them and nothing was ever done. But that was one that I, I guess the highest publicized in this area of a labor. What was, what was your role in that case? I, I, was, I represented the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union gotcha. and, and, and the, <clears throat> where in every aspect of their negotiations of their uh, criminal cases and they were, nobody went to jail ultimately. You, other than the 300 that they put in jail and kept for three days. <laughs> you alluded earlier to uh, to a lawyer named Tommy Osborne. I want to talk to you a minute, or let you talk to us for a minute, about the Hoffa case. Uh, when Hoffa was originally indicted in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, you were his lawyer, were you not? Yes, yes. I... Would you tell us uh, uh, 
one who Hoffa was. There may be some people who don't yeah. know who Hoffa yeah. was. Well, Jimmy Hoffa was the president of the Teamsters Union. He's out of Detroit, Michigan. Uh, and uh, I had represented the Teamsters here some through the years. And uh, 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 with being in all fairness, of course, there was a tremendous fight going on between Bobby Kennedy and Hoffa. They'd indicted Hoffa in Washington, D.C. three times before, and he'd been turned loose every time. And, of course, our good friend uh, John Siegenthaler was working for Kennedy at the time. And I, I knew uh, John Siegenthaler is a great human being. Uh, Bobby Kennedy was a great human being, but they did have a vendetta going between themselves. I mean, it was two, both sides of each other. Uh, so uh, they, uh, Bobby came down and uh, visited the federal judges, and the first thing we know, he was indicted in Nashville for uh, a Taft-Hartley violation of having a contract on transportation of automobiles in interstate commerce uh, and, and possess an interest in the industry, as well as being the labor leader. You withdrew from that case. Uh, when the, when the, they started, uh, we, I, I represented them through all motions. And uh, then, then they started, it, when it was going to trial. And uh, I got vibes, and I did not know anything was wrong, for sure. But I got vibes that, that there was improper activity, particularly in jury, contacting ju prospective jurors. And so I asked Judge Miller, whom I liked a great deal, uh, told him that I, I wanted to withdraw from the now case. Judge William E. Miller, who was yes. a federal judge. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And uh, I, that I wanted to withdraw. And he said, uh, well, now, you wouldn't be pulling a stunt to withdraw so you can get additional time, would you? Very nicely. He's a gentleman from East Tennessee. And I said, no, I, I just want to withdraw from this case. Well, he said, you're not going to withdraw until you tell me why you're withdrawing. And I said, Judge, I am not going to tell you why I'm withdrawing. It laid just like that for a month, month and a half or so. And finally, I just, out of the blue, got an order permitting me to withdraw from the case. Why, why did you feel you couldn't tell him that you were going to withdraw? Well, I, I, or why you know, why? Were I, I, I didn't think it appropriate. Fair. Frankly, a lawyer should have a right to withdraw from a case if he, in his judgment, knows without, uh, shall we say, without tattling on his client. I couldn't have tattled so to speak. I couldn't have reported a specific activity at that point in time uh, that was going on that I felt that the juror was being tampered with or attempted to be. Uh, I felt both sides were doing it, frankly. <coughs> but uh, So he allows you to withdraw. He eventually. allows me to withdraw, and then Tommy Osborne is employed. By uh, Hoffman. Now, who is Tom? Who was Tommy Osborne? Tommy Osborne was well. He was going to be president of the National Bar Association about that time, moving up the scale. He'd been an assistant U.S. attorney. Uh, he'd been a, a, with Denny Leftwich in Glasgow, lawyers mostly civil law practice, uh, and he he was a very good lawyer. Had he uh, also tried the one man one vote case? He did. He he he'd handled that, uh, and I was uh, I, I filed an amicus brief in that case for the F of L C I O, and uh, and he he did a tremendous job on one man one vote, and so we we had several amicus briefs filed, and the F of L C I O asked that I file one and did, but uh, it was a tremendous victory for Tommy. All right. Yeah, go ahead. He then, well, he, he then came into the case, uh, representing Hoffa. Of course, I, I, I had no further obligation after get, being able to withdraw, but I had filed all the preliminary pleadings and motions and briefs and so forth up to that point in time, and I did confer as I thought it appropriate to, with him on those motions and and give him he could, the matter of public record anyway, but he would have those, and. Uh, then it got to where that I felt that he knew or had learned and was participating in efforts to influence the jury improperly. I met with him in his office and, and told him my feelings. That's after I was out of the case. And for, he, that if he was doing that, he was going to get in serious trouble. We were in his office. There's a fireplace there. And I said, Tommy, 
was first they had several people in there when this discussion went put, would take place. Vic, whatever his name was, Squeal later on, uh, was there. And I said, who are these people? I didn't know them. And they said, they're all friends. You can talk freely. And I said, well, Tommy, what I was going to say is this. I lay you 100 to 1 that there's a mic in that chimney right there right now. Oh, no, they wouldn't do that. Well, there was. And I later learned it to be a fact. So, uh, so Tommy Osborne represented Hoffa. Uh, it subsequently developed that the jury had been tampered with. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tommy was tried and convicted. Right, and uh, uh, two of the great lawyers of this town was in that case, uh, Hook, uh, John Hooker and Jack Norman. Jack Norman represented Tommy Osborne right. in that proceeding. And he was convicted. He was convicted. And right. took his own life. Later on, he went to serve some time, got out actually, got back home, uh, and just couldn't survive it, and he killed himself. I'd represent his daddy, who was Thomas' daddy, so there's something, there's something there. I'd represent his daddy earlier in an attempted suicide situation. Let's talk a minute. Do you feel comfortable talking about the Powell murder case? Uh, to a degree. Uh, what was the Powell murder case? Well, Bill Powell, uh, whom I did not know at the beginning at all, I knew Dick Satterfield, who was head of the uh, was executive director of the Tennessee Automotive Association. Uh, but Bill Powell was accused of uh, killing his partner, Gurley, in the capital Chevrolet. The officers were out on Murfreesboro Road. Uh, but I got a call from um, Dick Satterfield, who is now dead, a great friend of mine, uh, saying that Powell was out in the hospital, that he had been shot, and wanted to know if I would go talk to him. And of course, I'd had very, I'd had criminal law practice only in the labor field mostly up to that point. And uh, I said, well, I go talk to him, but I don't know that, uh, I, I don't just don't like murder cases. Uh, I'd never had at that point a murder case uh, as such, possible first degree murder case, because I would just did not want to be in it. Uh, I didn't want to be in the case I lost, was, was the real worry. <laughs> so I went out and saw him, and he'd been shot in the leg. and. Uh, Later on, uh, the claim was made that he shot himself in the leg, and he also shot his partner, Gurley, and killed him uh, over a dispute as to who would be the dealer or who would be the partner in Capital Chevrolet. Now, this, uh, the, I, I feel a comfortable, Bill, in this respect, that when the case came to trial, the, every word that was said in the courtroom was run in the newspaper. They had court reporters who would come in and spend 15 minutes each. They'd go out and transcribe their notes. Uh, newspapers were paying for it, uh, and, and, and there was no prohibition against doing it that way. Uh, they, they would go out and send another one in, transcribe it, and have it. So it was all run in the newspaper. And by the way, uh, during, and Jane, my two ch lawyer children, uh, blew up those, and I have a copy of all those newspapers. I, I, I look forward to when, when I learned I was going to be here and the secretary told me all those papers have been thrown away. I said, if they are, somebody's going to <laughs> suffer. <laughs> but in any event, see what they found. Uh, but that, that was the type of case that went on. And uh, uh, it drug out for a long time. Well, you had a special prosecutor in that Yeah, case. John Hooker Sr. was special prosecutor. And Tommy Shriver was the district attorney? Right. And a young uh, Hal Harden was uh, an assistant district attorney. He was assistant district attorney. Right. So they were. And who was helping you in the case? Uh, well, at the end, uh, Jack Norman, uh, I, I felt that, and, uh, and John Toon, uh, who had married. Uh, it's Norman's daughter. No, daughter, right. Uh, was, wanted to get Jack in for advice, and that was a good idea. I uh, certainly was all for it. I have heard it said, and I want to see if you agree, that you and Mr. Norman paid Mr. Hooker Sr. the greatest compliment that could ever be paid a trial lawyer, that uh, when it came time to argue the case, the district attorney general sort of perfunctorily opened the argument. And then obviously it would have been the turn for you and Mr. Norman, but the two of you waived closing argument in a murder case. 
And uh, many people thought that the reason for that was because of the extensive oratorical abilities of John Hooker Sr. in making a closing argument to a jury in a criminal case. Do you have any comment about that? Oh, the, uh, well, we, we talked at length, of course, Powell, but Powell made that decision, uh, had to ultimately to whether or not we would argue. Of course, that uh, we, we knew that we could foreclose Hooker's argument, and he was a great lawyer, and he would have waved that bloody shirt all over that back and forth, up and down, and walked back and forth. And I later learned from his wife that he had spent 10 hours in, before a mirror practicing what he was going to say. <laughs> That's to his credit. I don't mean that. But yeah. it was music. She told me that. said He spent at least 10 hours in front of a mirror practicing his closing argument. Well, he didn't get to make it. You, you have been in so many interesting cases that we could spend an awful lot of time talking about them. Just very briefly, uh, tell me about your representation of Judge uh, Charles Galbraith uh, and his tax case. And before you answer that, why don't we take a short break? Okay. The uh, Galbraith case I th had asked you about, uh, I believe, before. Yes, uh, the uh, uh, well, the judge uh, Galbraith had been indicted in federal court for tax fraud. Uh, who, tax. who who is Judge Galbraith? Ju he was on the Court of Appeals, and he served in the uh, uh, Court of Criminal Appeals. Uh, criminal Appeals, yes. Mm -hmm. And they had got a special judge in from Michigan named Hart, and of course the basis generally was that he had not paid his income tax and they, they net worthed him and that sort of thing. And it was a rather interesting case, of course, representing the judge and, uh, and Galbraith in particular, who uh, liked to dictate how his case would be tried. Uh, and uh, we got very fortunate in that case. Well, at one point, uh, the, we, we got it down to the FBI witnesses, the government did. And we got down to the witnesses, why the FBI witnesses, why when when one would come back in, it, it it just dawned on me that they were all going back as they went out into the same room, and so I had somebody follow them while at a re recess, and they were they were going and they could hear them talking, uh, so I asked the judge if he would permit me to voir dire the next witness that came on. And the FBI witness got on the stand, and I went through. I said, you know so-and-so and so-and-so? So. I said, sure. And you've been going back into the room. They've been coming. The witnesses that have testified have been coming back in the room. And you've been talking? Yeah, we've been talking. What would you talk about? And he started waff waffling. And finally said, I said, didn't you talk about what they testified about? He said, not really. But uh, one of them said, did say that they asked him, ask him this question. I forget what question it was. And so uh, Judge Hart just slammed the gavel down and said, no more witnesses in the FBI. Those, and you strike all the testimony of those witnesses who've here been back and forth in between uh, times and talk, going back to the same room and talking about this case. And said, didn't, didn't I instruct you not to talk? And uh, so uh, that was the we the sure win in the case because they got got, got cut off <coughs> completely from further testimony as far as the FBI was concerned. Uh, I think we may have had the case won anyway, but when the jury came back in, uh, they they handed the judge uh, in their own ha handwriting the foreman uh, the, the verdict of not guilty. And uh, as uh, when he let the jury go, he asked me to come up. I walked up and he said, here, I thought you might want to keep that. <laughs> so, but it was, it was rather interesting. Of course, Charlie's been a rather controversial person, uh, generally on the right side of things, but can go, go way off. He was the first Davidson County public defender, wasn't he? Right. Mm -hmm. He was. Let me ask you how long you uh, plan to continue your practice and your community involvement. Uh, grew up, having grown up where I did, when the good Lord calls me home, <laughs> I will quit. You have no plans to quit or retire? No, I would like to get a day off, though. <laughs> 
I, I do. I have slowed down some, but not uh, not a tremendous lot. I've slowed down in community activity, although I like the political end and still work quite a bit, and will be working the Gore campaign uh, considerably, and uh, anybody else that I think is doing the right thing. Looking back over your career, your distinguished career, well, you're very kind. What are the rewards and advantages that you feel you have received and or obtained from being a lawyer? Well, the rewards, uh, any lawyer that practices law as long as I have and doesn't feel tremendously rewarded by having been permitted to be a lawyer, there's uh, something wrong with him. There is no greater profession at, uh, uh, known to man. Now, my mother, who was fairly religious, used to say, say, well, now the Bible says, woe be unto the doctors and lawyers. And it does say that. <laughs> but uh, uh, the, the practice of law, being a lawyer, having the privileges that goes with that, and the responsibilities, which too few of us assume, is, is something that is just, uh, it is just wonderful that a person can be a lawyer. Looking back over your career from the vantage point of, of November 1999, would you do it all over again? Uh, I'd do it all over again, just what I did, and try to do it better. We talked earlier in our discussion about uh, some of the things that you, you find to be problems in the present day uh, legal profession. Uh, what worries you the most about the future of the legal profession in this state and in this country? Well, uh, I've been a member of the Trial Lawyers Association, helped put it together as far as Tennessee was concerned. But I, the, this concept that everybody has to be sued about something or for something, uh, going and digging out cases, advertising for cases, inter, uh, interloping into various things. Now, that's not to say that lawyers shouldn't do, be sure that the public is protected, but to have that is a sole objective of fer ferreting out. For example, I had a lady uh, who was hurt rather seriously in an automobile accident, was laying in the hospital, uh, hardly knowing where she was, and a lawyer came in and gave her a long speech about how he could uh, do a great deal, how, what a firm he had and what they could do, and, and actually to the point to where it was harmful to her health. Now, this has been a few years ago. But that sort of law practice, it, it, I have an aversion to. Uh, I have some considerable adver aversion to uh, lawyers advertising, very frankly. I, I personally would prefer to not have that go on. But we're over that area, the free speech with which I agree basically uh, permits that and they have that privilege. But, the, but j just the, the concept of outright publicity uh, or advertising and, and possibly overstating, uh, puffing the wares a little too much, uh, it, 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 I just don't like. Now, do you think that ties into what uh, you said earlier about the about the inordinate focus on the amount of money that uh, is to be made or can be made? Well, of course, there's no there's no doubt but what it has. It it is it is the greed to a large extent. Uh, everybody should be entitled to do that which is legal, proper, and fair. But but it's been carried, as far as I'm concerned, to, to far to the extremes. Uh, the the Waverly cases, I believe you may have been in on, but in, I was in on them. And, and the the number of people that were contacted, ever and their doctors contact had to have some of them would have their doctors contact the people who were hurt, uh, and that's been going on consistently. The class action cases with which I agree, basically, there's a great place for them. And there's no question but what uh, that uh, lawyers have done a great deal of good, and there's no question but what many people would never have their rights protected except for the contingent fee arrangement and, and the assistance that's given it. That is good. But it, it, I think it's been carried to extremes. And I think it's a real danger to the legal profession. How would you like to be remembered? Uh, uh, I, I'd prefer you ask my children what they would like me. <laughs> Not really. Uh, 
I, I, I feel, it, and I'm humbled by it, very frankly, in this proceeding right here, but I'd like to be remembered as one who has thought, sought to live a just and fair life and protect those and assist those who are not capable of looking after themselves. All right, one last question. You have 10 grandchildren. Yes. You have four exceptional children, and you have a super excep exceptional wife. I agree with all that. <laughs> I didn't ask you to ask me that question, but I'm glad you did. <laughs> Suppose two of those grandchildren, a granddaughter and a grandson, said, we want to be lawyers, granddad. Mm -hmm. Would you write us a letter of advice on things that you think would be important for us to know as we enter the legal profession? Now, that's a broad question mm -hmm. and covers an awful lot of territory. Mm -hmm. But what are some of the things that you would say to your grandson or your granddaughter who said, we want to become lawyers? Well, the first thing I would tell them is that you have lived your life knowing me. You have lived your life knowing that I have not sought to interfere in any, to any extent at all in your life. I have not encouraged you to be a lawyer or a preacher or a doctor, and I have one granddaughter who tends to go to medical school. But you just remember what I have told you from the, as early as I can remember, as you can remember, and that is that every human being owes a tremendous obligation. If they have a privilege of helping others, they should do it. And any neglect on their part in not looking after others and rendering a public service, then you're not living up to what the standards that I have seek, sought to teach you. And, the, the, and I have. I have taught the children and the grandchildren alike that they owe an obligation to the public to, to give 10 to 25 percent of their time to public service in some form. And I have done that. And I would encourage them to do it. To become a lawyer, I would tell them that it is the greatest profession known to man. They have, a lawyer has more opportunities, in my judgment, even than doctors in many situations, to render needed service to those in need. And if you, if you do become a, a lawyer, take the time out from your profession to do the things that you have an obligation to do and serve society with at least 20 percent of your time. And I've taught them that ever since they were very young. Thank you very much. It's been a great privilege, Cecil, for me to uh, talk to you on these subjects. Well, you're, you're very kind. You're a great lawyer so, yourself. <clears throat>